Okay, so now we are live, I would say. So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for waiting. Um, I think that uh, you already know our guest today, who will be presenting. Uh, today, we are delighted to welcome Dave Farley to talk about his book on modern software engineering. So as you may already know, Dave uh, is a pioneer in continuous delivery, thought leader and expert practitioner in continuous delivery, DevOps, DDD, and software design. In his talk, they finally will explore the fundamentals of our profession, what really works to help us build better software faster and provide examples that illustrate these ideas to form the basis of a modern, agile engineering approach to software development. <laughs> So, Dave, with no further ado, thank you for coming over, and it's your turn. Thank you. I'll just uh, select my presentation. Uh, okay, so hopefully you can see my presentation on the screen. I'll just put it full screen. Right, hopefully you can see that. <clears throat> um, so... Uh, Hold on a minute. I think I've got the wrong. Somehow I've got the wrong presentation on the screen there. There, that's the, that's the one that I wanted. Sorry about that. Let's try that again. Hopefully you can still see that presentation. Right, so my topic for today really is thinking about what engineering means for software. It's It's my argument let me start another way. I, I spent the early part of my career with job titles like software engineer, and we did nothing at all that vaguely re re resembled engineering of any form, as far as I could tell. Later, I worked for companies that really didn't like the term engineering applied to software. Um, they thought that, that was the wrong mental model for what it was that we did. And during that time, I, I largely agreed with them. Then later still, I, I worked on some complicated things and we started to apply the principles of continuous delivery and, and other ideas that we thought felt more like an engineering discipline and stuff worked an awful lot better and so I started to think of maybe this engineering was the right model and that's really what I want to talk to you about today and if that was the case why would it matter and what would it be like what would what would software engineering be if engineering was the right approach to solving problems in software. And clearly, I profoundly think that it is these days. <clears throat> so a good place to start for that is to, to, to imagine. So, so think about what does engineering really mean? What is engineering? <clears throat> and in other disciplines, I think it's a reasonable statement to say that engineering is just the stuff that works. In other disciplines, if we are doing something and it not works, if the aeroplanes that we're building are crashing or the cars that we are building aren't fuel efficient enough, we change things until they are. That's what engineering is. En engineering is a pragmatic approach to solving problems. And that seems pretty close to the sort of things that we do. Ex so, 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 But what are the things that work for us? And I think that's less about the way that we think about and ad adapt to how we should organize our work very often. <clears throat> the thing that's clearly evident, uh, and, uh, and the reason that I've got a picture of a bridge on the screen, is as a result of talking about engineering in software terms, I get involved in lots of conversations about bridges for some reason, because people say, Dave, that's all very well, but what we do isn't bridge building. And I think that's two things i think it's one to misrepresent what bridge building is and two to ignore the fact that engineering is different in different contexts of course software isn't the same as bridge building there are different sets of constraints and different problems to solve but also bridge building probably isn't what we think it is if you're building the first kind of bridge that's ever built been built that's going to be a very different kind of engineering challenge to building the millionth kind of wooden footbridge over a small stream. If it, 
the second one is a problem of project management and logistics. The first one is a problem of design and exploration. And, and, and so the, f the first category is much closer to where we are as a discipline. <clears throat> Engineering is not the same in different disciplines outside of software. Aviation, the aviation industry engineering is different to bridge engineering, and they're both different to car engineering, all different to chemical engineering, rocket engineering, chemical engineering, whatever else we think about. These are related but different disciplines. They share some common traits, but they're not the same thing. They're not cookie cutter. I think often we confuse the idea of engineering with the idea of mathematical precision. And that's not it at all. <clears throat> I'm going to try and point out some of the more fundamental ideas that are common between engineering disciplines and certainly applicable to us by pointing out some examples from aviation, the car industry, and space, the space program. <clears throat> I might also mention Lego as well. So what does this all mean for us? What is engineering? Engineering is the application of an empirical scientific approach to finding efficient solutions to practical problems. That's my working definition. And I've kind of passed the, pared this down so that each of these words, I think, is, is pretty much essential. It's empirical. It's, it's, it's based on the real world. It's, it's not a theoretical discipline. But it uses scientific rationalism. We, we're not necessarily discovering profoundly new knowledge, but we, we will be discovering new ways of using uh, deeper knowledge from, from other, other places. And we need to find efficient solutions, efficient in terms of performance, but most important, in engineering terms, um, economically efficient solutions to pr problems that matter for people. And I, I think that's what I mean when we're talking about it. So bear that in mind as we're discussing this. To put this more simply, <clears throat> engineering is how we as a species solve the hard problems, whatever those hard problems are. You can certainly think of the approach to discovering new medicines as a form of engineering. This science, the, uh, the practical aspects of um, experimental science is certainly an engineering discipline when we're talking about building things like large hadron colliders. Uh, the internet is an engineering um, output <clears throat> more profoundly than that perhaps is that engineering is the foundation on which our technical culture is built we can plot a graph i, I this isn't my graph i just found this on the internet this is a graph of technical technological progress um, through human history so so the the flat line at the bottom of this goes way off to, to the left-hand side of this diagram. We've existed as a distinct species for around about 300,000 years. And technologically, almost nothing happened during that time. Up until just a few thousand years BC, um, we, we only had stone tools, really. And then something happens <clears throat> around... 15, 1600, and technological advancement explodes. And the thing that happened was the discovery of science. We had a better way of organizing and understanding our learning and creating new knowledge. And that resulted in this technological explosion. Here's another graph. This is a graph based trying to map the rate at which human knowledge expands. At the start of the 20th century, knowledge was doubling every century. The whole of human knowledge doubled roughly once, once every century. By 1945, the whole of human knowledge was doubling every 25 years. By 1982, when this research was first carried out by Buckminster Fuller, an IBM research fellow, knowledge was estimated to be doubling every 12 to 13 months. Current predictions say that knowledge is doubling every 11 to 12 hours. I'm not quite sure whether that last one's correct or not, but it's close to correct. The, the amount of information that we are gaining is just exploding, and you can see that pretty much everywhere. So science happened somewhere down there, and the invention of computers and software happened around here. 
So we're living through some interesting times, to say the least, and engineering really is at the heart of this. So what's engineering really for? And I think we make a mistake here, and I think this is where the people that, that say that we're not engineers because, because we're not bridge builders are getting things wrong. So I think the assumption is that what we're, what we're looking for from engineering is to define the one true solution, the perfect result, and that's not it at all. Engineering is not about defining the, the, the best solution even. Engineering is about ruling out the stupid solutions. Engineering is what's, what allows us to, to build aeroplanes that don't kill us or to build bridges that meet in the middle or to, to all of these things are you know, representative of the, the kinds of things that engineering is designed to address. When something bad happens, we learn from what, what, what went wrong and we engineer subsequent solutions to make sure that that kind of failure doesn't happen again. <clears throat> So engineering is often characterized in the terms of the things that we can't afford to get wrong. And I think often what we think about is this. And these are really production lines. These are here to solve a very, very different problem to the engineering problem. Engineering problem, as I see it, and, and in the mode of avoiding those bad solutions, is really a very creative discipline. This is not. This is for simple problems that we understand perfectly so we can build a production line and repeatedly churn out the same donut every time on the same airplane every time. Um, so this isn't our problem. This is not the software development problem at all. So, so these kind of production lines are not the answer. These don't fit our problem. Our problem is very, very different indeed. Our problem is our discipline is a creative one. So we're going to start off with some kind of problem and we're going to come up with some ideas and we're going to crystallize those ideas in the form of a stream of binary data. Any system that we build is going to end up as a stream of bits and bytes. And one of the unique properties of a stream of bits and bytes that computers and software give us is we have the ability to reproduce that stream perfectly in essence for essentially zero cost so at the push of a button we can clone that stream of bytes as many times as we like what this means is this has some uh, this has a profound impact on, on on what it means to build software we don't have a production problem because this is production for us just copy what we've already done what that means is that the economics of software is different to the economics of making physical devices. If I'm making a donut or an aeroplane, then the cost of production matters a lot. And being able to do that for a certain cost is an important idea. But for us, once we've done all of the initial work, the cost of production is essentially zero. And so we'd be stupid to um, do the same work twice because because we could get, have something for free. We could do, we could just clone the work that we did before and have something for free, or we, we could do lots of work and do it for, for a cost because, because the work costs. So that means that when we are building software, we are always in our own context, at least doing something new. And that's a very different kind of activity. That's not the cookie cutter waterfall process production line style solution that works that's that just doesn't fit engineering is about exploration and discovery if we're doing something new we're always exploring and discovering what's going on software development is about exploration and discovery so the stuff that works is that we need to optimize for learning uh, as part of our discipline, the, the, the foundational idea, one of the foundational ideas for, for us as professionals in software development is that we need to become excellent at optimizing for learning. And the other foundational discipline is that we need to optimize for managing the complexity of the systems that we build. Modern software systems are enormously complex, complex on a scale that seems ridiculous compared to physical devices, really. Um, and and so we we must be able to both uh, 
optimize for learning and manage the complexity of the systems that we build so that we can continue to learn and continue to move forwards. So optimizing for learning is characterized by these five ideas. And I go into these ideas in much more detail in, the, in, in my book, Modern Software Engineering, that we're here to talk about today. But I just want to kind of touch on these quickly. So we need iteration. This is the first powered, human-carrying, controllable, heavier-than-air aeroplane. And all of those qualifications matter because there were versions of other aircraft that could do parts of that but not pull it all together. So this is the first one that could carry somebody for any, any kind of appreciable distance under power with control. And this is the first flight, which was less than the wingspan of a Boeing 747. In the early days of aviation, the people that were doing this pioneering were enormously brave people because a very high proportion of them were injured or more often killed by the devices that they were pioneering in. These were dangerous devices. They weren't very good at flying and the smallest little error and they'd crash and they'd kill person. One of the brother, one of the Wright brothers, you can see one lying down on the airplane and one standing at the side, one of them was killed in this aeroplane later on, or, or a, a later version of it anyway. But what happened in aviation is that over the period of a century, um, we learned things uh, through engineering disciplines and we started applying the techniques of iteration. So we started every time we, we, we tried something, every time we built a new aeroplane, we'd try something new and we'd refine that, we'd learn from that and we'd develop that. In the middle of the 20th century, um, roughly the st start of the, the Second World War, we ended up with aeroplanes like these. These were really the first practical passenger carrying aeroplanes. And th they, were, they were good. They, 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 were, they flew a bit lower and they got subject to bad weather. And so there were crashes that killed people and so on. But they were, they were, they were pretty good compared to the early days. These days, we end up with stuff like this. In 2017, the equivalent of two-thirds of the population of the planet flew on a commercial airliner, and there were no, zero fatalities as a result of that. That's the first time that happened. Aeroplanes are safer than... If you're sat in an aeroplane listening to me talk, then you'd be safer than sat where you are, statistically speaking, because they're enormously safe because they've been engineered to be safe over time, and that's through a process of iteration. So how does that work? Iteration is, is, is a surprisingly powerful idea. If we've got a target of some kind like this and a starting point, wherever the starting point is, we can hit that target with two simple ideas. So if we make progress iteratively in small steps, then what we can do is that we can try, and as long as we've got a measuring stick, a fitness function that can determine whether each small step moves us closer or further from the goal, then we can do this. We can say, let's start here and try that. Is that a good direction or not? No, that's bad. That takes us further from the goal. So we could lose that change. And then we could try another change. Does that move us closer to the goal? Yes, it does. So we'll keep that one. And then we'll start again. And this way, we will hit the goal. It might take us a, a lot of different iterations. Um, and even if we only did these made these changes randomly, we'd hit the goal this way. This is essentially how machine learning works. But we can do better than doing it randomly. We can have a theory about what improves our score on the fitness function, and we can try those out so we can make the goal in fewer steps. But it's still iterative. In order for this to work, what we need is feedback. And the feedback in this very simple model is the measurement against the fitness function. And feedback is also one of those things that kind of feels a little bit informal, but I think that's a mistake. So let's imagine that we're tasked with balancing a broom. So we could do it the waterfall way. We could decide to have a look at the broom and we could do great measurements and calculations of the broom and determine its center of mass. And then we remember some schoolboy physics, school, school children physics and say, OK, so in order to balance something, we need to make sure that the a line drawn through the center of the mass passes through the point of contact. Um, 
and we could manipulate the broom with great accuracy to make sure that there's no little impulse left that means that the br broom is very slightly, slightly falling one way or another and balance it perfectly. Except that's not what happens. What happens is this, because there's only one solution to balancing a broom like this. It, it's, it's a very, very fragile kind of way of doing it. So, so practically, we could, we could do it, but it's not a good way of solving this problem. A much better way of doing it, and the way that all of us would probably do it, is we'd get the broom, if we were asked to balance the broom, we'd get the broom, we'd put it on our hands, and we'd start wiggling our hands. And if the broom started tipping, we'd react to the tip using feedback, and we'd react to the feedback, and we'd correct. And we, we'd wiggle our hand around, and we'd keep the broom balancing. This may sound like a more informal way of doing things. The first approach might may, may sound as though it's more rigorous because we're measuring things and doing calculations and stuff, but it's not. This is the more this is the more robust approach. In fact, this is the way that space rockets fly. Space rockets use exactly this mechanism by gimballing that is directing the thrust of their their rockets to correct for small tips. So they have sensors that determine where the rocket is pointing or where it's how it's tipping, and then they control the engines to counteract those tips just in just the same way that your hand counteracts how the, the broom tips. Feedback is a much more robust way, a much more stable way of reacting to dynamic problems in this way. The next idea, if we are going to optimize for learning, is to be incremental. That is, we need to approach design in an evolutionary stance. We want to be able to grow our system small step by small step. This is the first component of the International Space Station that was launched into space. It was based on um, a Russian spacecraft. And these are some later iterations as they started building it out until they end up with something like the picture in the bottom right here today. When they started out, they had a rough idea of what the whole thing was going to be like, uh, something vaguely like the thing on the right, but it wasn't precisely accurate. It wasn't precise. There were changes that happened during the evolution of the design because as they started doing things, they learned more stuff and they were able to adapt to what they were doing and so build a more, more robust space station as a result. This is how engineering really works. And the, it is an experimental discipline. We, we, we're going to try stuff out and see what works. When I use the word experimental, people will often say that's too scary. You know, they say things like, we can't afford to fail in our business. Well, if you can't afford to fail, you can't afford to win either, really, because being experimental is at the heart of what's necessary to make progress, to innovate. So if we want to make progress, we must be experimental. But we can do that in controlled ways so that we are we are less likely to to risk our business or, or to hurt people or, uh, with, with our software or whatever else it might be. So controlling the variables is part of being experimental. We want to limit the impact of things going wrong, but we want to allow ourselves the freedom for things to go wrong so that we can learn from those 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 times. Here's a good example from the aviation industry again. For most of the, the 20th century and, and into the 21st century, the way that you test a new aeroplane is that you don't just go and fly a new aeroplane with a new engine. That's deemed too risky. So what you do instead is that you control the variables. So if you've got an old aeroplane with an old engine and you want to introduce a new aeroplane with a new engine, what you do is that you take the engine off the old aeroplane and you fit the new engine onto the old aeroplane. And then you get brave people called test pilots to go and fly the aeroplane and see if they come back. Uh, if if it all works out and that works out okay, then you do the next stage. You take the new airframe and the old engine and you put the old engine on the new airframe and you go and fly this for a while with your test pilots. And if all that works out, then you put the pieces together and you get to go and fly the new air, airplane with the new engine. So what they're doing is that they're de-risking each part, the airframe of the of the aeroplane and the engine are independently a risk. So they're de-risking the problem by working experimentally and trying out each part more independently of the other. And so they can better understand the results that they see. 
And last in my list of um, techniques for learning is being empirical. That is reacting to the real world. So here's another example from the aviation industry. So this is the first jet aircraft. This is a German aeroplane. It was built during the Second World War. Um, and it's it's called a Heinkel, the, is the manufacturer. And this looks rather different to most jet aeroplanes today uh, in that the nose is tilted up and the tail is pointing towards the ground. That's a classic layout for um, a fighter aeroplane of the time. And that's because fighter aeroplanes at the time had very powerful engines and they needed room for big propellers at the front of the aeroplane to clear the ground on takeoff. So they came up with this arrangement of the undercarriage. So the big wheels are at the front and there's a little wheel at the tail so that the nose of the aeroplane is ticked up, making more clearance at the front of the aeroplane. So without thinking about it really, they just built the, the, the first jet aeroplane in uh, along the same model. They went and flew it with a propeller first and, and that was okay. And then they fitted the jet engine they went and flew it and the jet engine melted all the runways because it's pointing down at the ground. So they changed it so that it looked more like a modern jet where the jet, the body of the jet is horizontal to the ground and you change the arrangement of the wheels. That was empirical learning. They discovered, and nobody sat and thought about that beforehand. They just made a mistake. So if we want to innovate, if we want to evolve our systems, we need to allow room for that kind of empirical learning. We need to be able to discover where we're wrong, where, where, where our ideas are mistaken, because most of our ideas are mistaken. Uh, Microsoft did some research into the value of their ideas. They estimated that two thirds of their ideas produced zero or negative value for Microsoft. So all of our ideas are open to being mistaken. If you start off a project thinking that your ideas are good, you're almost certainly wrong. If you start off thinking that your, pro your ideas are probably wrong, you're almost certainly right. It's the contradiction of scient scientific rationalism, really. The, the great example, current example of empirical discovery and engineering is probably SpaceX and the development of their Starship. This is the space, the reusable spacecraft the first fully reusable spacecraft um, that that they're working towards that is destined to carry people to, to live on Mars, uh, they hope. Um, and they're spending lots of money and they're blowing up lots of hardware because stuff goes wrong. But they expect that. They're, they're working consciously in an empirical way. They're making progress in small steps. Every single version of the rocket is significantly different to the previous one based on learning from the previous set of experiments and empirical learning. This is one where they were trying to land the uh, first, the, the second stage rocket, the, the actual starship, and it didn't quite make it. The second part of, of this approach to of uh, uh, deciding that our software is, is based on engine should be based on an engineering approach is that software is often complex. And enormously so. The picture here with the Amazon label is a picture of the microservices in the Amazon ecosystem. And if in, in reality, this is a dynamic moving target. This is a, the, the, when you see an animated version of this, it almost looks organic. It's, it's, it's evolving and changing all of the time in structure and shape and connections because that's how their ecosystem works. Software development is about learning and about managing complexity. We need to be expert at both of these things to do a good job of software development. Managing complexity has five things too, which again in, is, the, is the third part of the, the, the book where we go into more detail of, of managing complexity. These are modularity, cohesion, separation of concerns, abstraction and coupling. So let's look at those in a little bit more detail too. So modularity is about dividing systems up into discrete pieces so we you know we, we can separate out the engines of an airplane from the rest of the airplane so if there's a problem with the um entertainment system on the airplane it's not going to stop the engine working we, we we can decouple these things closer to home perhaps this is a picture of an of an iphone and even something as tightly engineered to be you know a a, a 
from the outside a kind of solid block of cleverness in terms of our iPhones. It's still made of discrete parts, each of which is focused on a different part of the problem. That's what modularity is all about. We don't want the part of the, the system that's about cam the camera working to be worrying to be worrying about the, the charging circuit as well. We want to decouple these issues. Modularity allows us to do that. An example that's a bit closer to home is probably this. So when I started writing software, which is several decades ago, if you wanted to print something out on a printer, you had to write the code yourself. You had to know exactly which printer you, you, you were going to be printing out on, and you had to write the codes that that printer would understand and send them to the printer because there wasn't a standard. There wasn't an approach to abstracting, to modularizing interactions with the printer. Sometime later, as the operating system starting to grow in capability, um, they, they came up with an abstraction for printing, and they, those were built into operating systems. So now we had the concept of printer drivers. So now I could talk to an abstract idea of printing, and I could plug in a module behind that abstraction that, that knew how to translate the abstract idea of printing into a concrete interactions with my particular printer. So this is the power of modularity that allows us to interact with other parts of a system without worrying too much about the detail. It allows us to change parts of the system without impacting other parts of the system. So that's all good. Here's another take on modularity. Here's some rather unpleasant code. This is written in C, but just because it's C doesn't mean it has to be unpleasant, but this one is. <clears throat> so this is 361 lines in an if statement. When I show this to people, the commonest feedback that I get is, oh, we have code that's much worse than that. But this is, this is what that looks like in the context of this function. Um, and I could improve the modularity of this code really easily. So if, if I look at this piece of code, here's the start. If unlikely bang CI. Every, everybody clear now what this is doing? No, me neither. So if I, I, start, I started looking into this code and I kind of tried to figure out what it was really doing. And I think that what it's really doing is this. So 361 lines is about creating a connection. So if there's no connection represented by CI, then create a new connection. And I think that's it. Uh, so if I did that, I'd improve the modularity of my code. And if I did that, then when I looked around other parts of this code base, there were lots of places to me that looked, without spending the rest of my life trying to understand it, that looked to me as though it was about creating a connection. So I'd probably get some reuse if I had more modular code like this, as well as being able to spend time on, more time on maintaining this particular version because it's being reused, so it's worth investing time in. So that might be a good way of improving quality in my code. <clears throat> my favorite description of quality in code is this, and it comes from Kent Beck. Good designs about moving the things that are related closer together and the things that aren't related further apart. So the things that aren't related is, is about modularity. The things that are related is about being closer together is about cohesion. We want the stuff that's related to be close in the code so that when we're looking at the code and we want to change something, what we need to change is all in front of us and we can change it in one go. Again, that makes it easier to manage that maintain, understand, and work with that code. Next in my list is separation of concerns. This is a modern electric BMW. Uh, and BMW have taken an interesting stance on the, the electrification of their, their fleet of cars. They've decided to separate the concerns of the, the, the actual practicalities of the transmission, the charging systems, steering, braking, all of those kinds of things from the utility of the vehicle, the, the shell. So if you want a BMW, an electric BMW, chances are that it's going to be built on the same framework, the same platform that does all of the, the steering uh, transmission and so on. But if you want a sports car, you put a different shell on top of that. If you want an SUV, you put a different shell on on top of that. They've separated these concerns and that gives them a lot of flexibility. They can invest more in the engineering of the platform because that's going to be shared between lots of cars. So economically, that makes sense. They're going to get reuse, but they can still tailor cars to the, the needs of individual customers. So they're going to get flexibility as well. So this is a good design choice. 
abstraction. So here's my favorite car from my presentation. This is also a car. This is clearly a very early car. Um, and there's almost no abstraction here. If you look, if you know anything at all about how cars work, if you look at some of the details, you can kind of work out what's going on. I'm fairly sure that this control here controls both the brakes and the, the, and the, the throttle, the accelerator, in one control. This thing that looks like a tiller is a tiller, and that's the steering mechanism. And you can kind of see how it works. It's kind of moving that tube and rotating it vertically. And at the bottom of the tube, you can see that there's a little crank that's connected to the front wheel that, that works the steering. So you can see all of this going on. There's, there's very little abstraction here. What happened in the evolution of the car is that we started to abstract things. So we came up with some st more standardized controls and we started to abstract those over time so that we end up with something that looks like this. This is a modern steering wheel, the equivalent of the tiller in the first car. Now, if you had a car with a steering wheel like this, what can you know about the steering? Well, you know that there is some, but you don't know how it works and you don't care. So it might be that it's mechanical. It might be parallelogram steering or rack and pinion. It might be that it's power assisted um, um, with some, some kind of um, hydraulic system. Or if it's a modern car, this might be rather like a joystick controller where it's just changing resistance in some electrical circuit and using that as a sensor and communicating with actuators that actually move the, the, the wheels and, ste and steer them. We've abstracted the problem so you don't know and you don't care how, how any of this works. This is what abstraction gives us. I, I more an example closer to our discipline perhaps we could have two pieces of software these two the, the blue and the orange and they're they're involved in this this interaction this conversation so we're going to initialize something and then we're going to confirm it's been initialized we're going to get the delivery date and then return the delivery date and then get vat return vat then on calculate the total for the order and we're going to order some items and then we're going to confirm that the order is placed by having a back channel that goes and looks in the database this is terrible this is horrible design. It's it, it, it's fragile, overcoupled, nasty. So we could do something else. We could abstract the conversation. So instead of doing all of that stuff, we could do the same thing, but more clearly. We could say we're placing an order and we're going to confirm that the order is placed. If we get the separation of concerns in the behaviors right, if we abstract the conversation, right at a level that makes sense in terms of our application this is a much better design it's much more flexible much less fragile we want to keep secrets in our design there are seams in in our software between different parts of the system between different modules of our system and we, we must keep secrets at those points that allows us to make change in one place without caring about what's going on in other places quite so much so working to abstract the conversations between these pieces is part of good design. I did say I might mention Lego. So here are two leg here are pictures of the output of two different Lego kits. When I was a kid, the Lego looked like the picture on the right. And when I'm playing with my lovely grandchildren, um, then um, we play with Lego like that as well. And they might build something and I'll say, oh, that's wonderful. What is it? Because I can't tell, because that they're just working off their imaginations, and they'll say, "Oh, it's a giraffe," and I'll say, "Of course, it's a giraffe. It's a perfect giraffe." And they can make giraffes or submarines or airplanes or anything they like, because the pieces are undifferentiated; they're generic pieces from which we can assemble an answer. The kit on the left is very, very different. I can't make a giraffe out of the kit on the left. I can't make a spaceship. I can't even make a different kind of car. I can't make a Lotus or a McLaren from the kit that's meant to be a Ferrari. So these these are both of these are valid solutions, but they represent very very different types of coupling. The 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 pieces of the car on the left um, have one place to go essentially, many of them. And if you put the one the one piece that's supposed to be in in place A in place B, you the, you're not going to be able to be, build a car. This is a fragile way of assembling a system. The pieces on the right 
they're much more flexible, much more vague in the way in which they can fit together. We can build things that are okay. reasonable answers uh, by relaxing the degree of coupling between the pieces. So managing the coupling between the pieces is an essential part of designing better software. Again, let's look at this in the context of software. Let's imagine that, that we've got these two pieces again, and this time we're still placing an order, but we're going to change the date format. If it's the first version of the conversation, then at the point at which we return the delivery date, because we've changed the date format in the orange service, that's going to break the blue service. And because the blue service talks to the database of the orange service, that's going to break everything. So we've just destroyed our system because the pieces were tightly coupled. If you don't recognize that, that's one of the difficulties in most ancient legacy systems is that they're highly coupled in unpleasant ways like that. If, however, we've abstracted the conversation more neatly, we've now got an opportunity to reduce the coupling and exert more control. So, for example, we could place a little adapter at the point at which we wanted to change the date format. We could add a little adapter to the orange service that when it saw a, a place order that was based on V1 dates, the old version of the API, we could translate our new, much better V2 dates into the old, out-of-date V1 form, and that keeps the blue one working. We've reduced the coupling between these pieces. We've improved the resilience of the system overall. We've allowed development to progress more independently if each of these are being worked on by different teams, for example, because we've decoupled the teams from one another. Um, the orange team can change the date format to their heart's content as long as they preserve the interface to the, the other team. So um, we've got these 10 ideas that, that kind of come together and I think these represent the tools of our trade. And I know that all of these ideas are familiar to you. And you might have been listening listening to me describe these things and thinking, yeah, I know this stuff. But I'm not just talking about these things in the, in the, the abstract. What I am saying is if you always, at every point when you've got a decision to make, prefer to maximize these things in, in making your choice, I think that you will end up with better results. So for Let's imagine for a moment that, that you are um, working on a project and you're not optimizing for learning. So th let's imagine two versions of that product. So first, you're not optimizing for learning and one second that you are. So you, you start off at the start of the project. You're not going to work iteratively. So now you've got to imagine every possibility, possibility, every idea that you need to think about before you start the project because you're not gathering feedback. You're not working it incrementally. You're not working experimentally. You're not discovering what really works with your users. So you've got to get everything right first time. You've got to, you've got to be brilliant. You've got to imagine precisely what, what you need to deliver to the users, and you've got to deliver on that thing perfectly first time because otherwise you're not doing these things. Chances of success, pretty much zero. Now imagine that you're after each tiny change, you're trying stuff out, so you're gathering feedback. You're, you're evolving the system based on, you know, if feedback's good, if you're going in the right direction uh, towards your goal, then you, that will determine what you do next. Um, and if you're not, that will, that will tell you what not to do next and, and so on. You can treat each of these small steps as an experiment. You can control the variables and minimize the risk of doing this. But which one of those is more likely to, to result in, in, in success? I guarantee the second one. Similarly, let's imagine two versions of a project in terms of how they manage complexity. One of them is there's no modularity. It's, it's, it's all just a mess of huge, complicated files. There's no cohesion. Ideas are spread across these massive, complicated files seemingly randomly. There's no separation of concerns. There's no clear way of delineating what one part of the software is doing versus another. The, the, the concepts of displaying stuff on the screen are mixed up with concepts of doing calculations and, and concepts of storing stuff in databases and parallelizing things to, 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 to maintain throughput, all of those kinds of things. 
There's no abstraction. There's no clear lines of separate uh, of delineation between bits of different parts of the system, and so it's all tightly coupled. If you're not familiar with that kind of system, then then you're very lucky. But these are so common that we even even have a name for it. We call them big balls of mud. Sometimes legacy systems. Not all legacy systems are bad like that, but some are. So a big ball of mud is is a very common kind of anti pattern. Now let's imagine a system that's modular. Each part is focused and clearly delineated. It's cohesive. When you're looking at at any given part of the code, everything you need to understand that part of the code is there in front of you. It's got good separation of concerns. Each part of the code is focused on achieving one result, not lots of different pieces. It's well abstracted where there's a conversation between different parts of the system. That's through a line of abstraction that's clearly defined and hides information about what's happening in the other part of the system. And those parts are ideally minimize the coupling between the pieces so that we can have change in one part of the system that doesn't impact anywhere else. Once again, I guarantee that you prefer to work on the second version of the system. And notice that I haven't said anything at all about the technology, the language that we've written in, the nature of the problem that we're solving. This is generically true about software of any kind. It doesn't matter whether it's OO or functional, it doesn't matter whether it's written in Rust or Clojure. Um, doesn't matter whether you're building space rockets or games for kids. All of these things, the all of these things are true. These combined, these things matter for one reason. They allow us to change our software. The idea here is uh, change is endemic. We can't avoid change. Everything changes, and it changes all of the time. This isn't because people are wrong. It's just the nature of things. It's not that our, our, our business users are, are silly, that they that they change their minds. It's because it's the nature of, of software and the world. Stuff changes all of the time. And so we need to be able to deal with that. And I would argue that the quality of a system is defined by our ability to change it. Nothing else really matters because the alternative is if we want, of course, there are other things that we want of our systems, but we, if we want our systems to be resilient and secure, then the only way that we can do that is by making a perfect guess before we start, if we can't change the software. If we can change the software, and our software isn't resilient or secure, we can discover how it's not, and we can fix it. So the ability to change the system is the defining quality, quality of, the defining property of quality software. And I'll, at that point, I'm going to stop with my presentation, and hopefully we can talk about it a bit. Thank you. Dave, thank you so much. And as Sophia was mentioning, this is such a great talk. You, you, it, it's like you, you have a, a gift of explaining a complex thing in, in, in an easy way, in a very logical way. So it looks easy. But uh, what, what is difficult is to, to basically do the easy things right. And we have a couple of questions. Uh, we don't have much time, but we do have a couple of questions. And the very first of it uh, is from Maria. And um, it's about AI. How do you see the field of software engineering evolving in the next decade, especially with emerging technologies like AI? Dave, what do you think about AI? So I, I, I think that I don't think that there's anything unique about information processing inside of wetware so I, I think that at some point ai will probably overtake us and it, and they'll be doing all of the coding i'm fairly confident that when they do though they'll be working iteratively using feedback and carrying out experiments and you designing systems that are more modular and cohesive because even as big as the however big their brains get there will still be a finite capacity to, to the ideas that they can think about, presumably. And so it's not going to be magic, so they're still going to need to abide by the laws of creating knowledge. And as far as we know, science is the best way of doing that. So applying these kinds of ideas 
will will be what the ideas will, will be what the AIs will be do, doing. I believe they'll be they'll still be working iteratively in small steps, and I think that's one of the the limitations that the current generation has. So if you look at tools like Copilot and stuff like that, they do just kind of seemingly just go bang. There's your there's your answer, rather than evolving systems. AIs aren't very good at going back and looking at buggy code and fixing it. They're not very good at enhancing code that's existing. They're good at writing it from scratch, giving a full description. And that's not good enough. That's that's not powerful enough. That's not what we do. That's not how we work. And that means there's going to be a severe limit, I think, on the utility of those tools until they're able to get to that point where they are working more incrementally because we won't be able to follow them. At the moment, you know, they make stuff up. You can you can ask you can give them a prompt you can ask that or you can start writing some code they can make suggestions that are just wrong some of the at the current generation they'll make suggestions that don't even compile sometimes so so we still need to be in charge and as long as we need to be in charge we need to be thinking incrementally because we need to be able to do stuff that fits inside our heads so, so I, I think it's coming, and and I think when it does, we'll have bigger problems than software development jobs because there's because it's going to impact everything when when AIs are that smart. But but I think that software is a difficult thing to do well, and when when AI can do it and replace us all, then they'll be replacing everybody else as well. So they'll be replacing CEOs and lawyers and doctors as well as us. <laughs> Exactly. So, so far, it's like uh, an assistant, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and and at the moment, the the, the level of assistance is, is a little bit, little bit long. There's, there's been some interesting data that suggests that the quality of code is reducing since the introduction of AI co-pilots and things because people trust it too much. Interesting. Uh, and, yeah. and it gives us. The, the the introduction to, to to the next question it's about like how do you improve your skills i i think you improve yeah so 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 i i i so so i i ought to say by my book but <laughs> but i i i think take these ideas seriously i i mean so the 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 the, the end of the book is about some of the, the the techniques that help us to maximize those things that maximize our ability to learn maximize our ability to manage the complexity and I think that those things, there's another five things. So I think those things are things like continuous delivery. I think working so that we can maintain our software in a release, permanently releasable state and be able to see that that's the case. Part of my definition of continuous delivery is you need to be able to determine that your software is releasable at least once per day. If you can do that, then you are in a learning mode. You are able to learn really fast because you can try something is my software still releasable after I've done that thing? If I replace my database with a graph database instead, is my software still releasable? So I can try stuff out. I can experiment and I can learn. I can gather feedback from all of my tests and so on. Test testing is, is a key to this. So I'm a big proponent of test-driven development and, and driving development from tests. And test the testability of our system is extremely well aligned with my five things in terms of managing complexity. It's almost impossible to imagine using test-driven development and not building more modular, more cohesive code with better separation of concerns, uh, better abstraction, and reduce reduce coupling. Because that's what makes code easy to test. Without those things, the code's too hard to test. And you, if you're writing the test before you write the code, you're going to be stupid writing code that's not easy to test. So you've got this pressure to get to... to better designed code from testability. So if you want practical advice, adopt continuous delivery, start doing test and development is one of the ways of building these skills. What that will do, it will point out holes in your design. And that's a good thing because now what you do is that you react and you start improving the quality of your design and you end up with better systems as a result. So basically your advice is to start with a TDD, at, at least with the unit testing, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, specifically TDD, unit testing is not enough. If we mean unit testing, testing after you wrote the code, what we want, we want to write, we want to write the tests before we write the code because that's what gives us feedback on our design. What that means is that we end up being the first users of our code. And if our, if if writing the test is hard, 
what that means is that our code sucks. So we need to change the design of our code so our code doesn't suck. <laughs> it, it smells. It smells. Yeah, 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 yeah totally right. Okay, uh, we have uh, one final question, um, and it's about how can we communicate the importance of optimizing for learning and iteration to clients who are certain of the solution that they need before the development begins? That's very difficult because now we're talking about dealing with irrational human beings. Um, I, I, I think... I think there are a lot. So, so there's some good books. That, so, so depending on where we're talking about this, that there, there are there are people that are, that are much more expert than me in kind of organisational change. There's a good book by Linda Rising called Fearless Change, which identifies a, a number of different patterns that you can apply to try and help you to change other people's minds. And that's kind of that's kind of interesting. There's some interesting stuff there. That some of the techniques that I use there, for sure. But but it's very much reactive. My approach, anyway, my, my view is it's very much circumstantial and reactive. That there isn't there isn't a simple recipe to doing this. I, my own view, when, when I work as a consultant, my own view of of working with with clients is it's my job to work in their interests. It's my job to try my best to maximize their outcome. Which means that if they're wrong, it's my job to tell them. Uh, and uh, it's it's no good just doing what they what they tell me to do because by definition almost uh, certainly my kind of consultancy it's my job to know a bit more about this than them they're bringing me in as an expert to try and help them to improve and so if if they i'm i'm going to try and give them that i'm going to try my best to give them that advice they might not take it but th then i can make a decide decision whether i want to carry on working with them or not uh, and that's a different kind of conversation to have. But in terms, in terms of trying to move people on, I, I think the techniques are you want to demonstrate it working. So you want to show this idea of working more incrementally and so on. Part of the ways is to show how their their grand vision at the start doesn't work out. You know, uh, so how you know if somebody has there's there's a lovely presentation by Goiko Adzik. Um, uh, based on the use of GPS and having the software equivalent of a GPS to navigate a project, I can't remember. I can't. I can't describe it to you, but it, but it it talks about a, a, a team that was making a game, and the boss came in and said, "We're going to do um, uh, you know, this big feature," and they said, "Okay," but but then he kind of started breaking it down and said, asking questions about it. And it's captured, the, the philosophy of how to do it is captured in Goiko's book, which is called Impact Mapping. So you start focusing the client on impacts rather than the solutions. And that's an awful lot about what I talk about as well. So an awful lot of my philosophy is to focus on the outcome that we're trying to achieve rather than the mechanisms that we use to achieve the outcome. Those are just tools. So if we, so if we, if we ask the customer, so... Okay, you want this thing. Why do you want this thing? You know, well, we'd like to recruit more users. Okay, so the real goal then is recruit more users. Let's try out your idea and see whether that results in us getting more more users. So we could try out a small experiment and see whether that got us more users. And that's exactly what Goiko talked about in his example. They a team that did this and they showed that the original the boss's idea didn't get them any more users. But something that so then they said, well, let's try this instead, and they kind of introduced them to the idea of working more experimentally, practically, and, and in small steps. This is just like wisdom coming yeah. from 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 you, from years of experience, years and years of, of experience. Um, we have one last question, like last minute question. Dave, do, do you have time for it? Sure. Hopefully. So uh, it's, it comes from Javi uh, Rodriguez, and one of the core assumptions for agile methodologies, in product area especially, is that users don't know what they want. From this, we see agile methodology like Lean uh, UX uh, be conceived having this in mind. Do you see a connection between experimentation in Lean UX and experimentation in engineering? Yes. Yes, I, I, and I, I think I think the thing, you know, 
part of what we're talking about is absolutely right. The users don't know what they want to either, but they do know what they don't like when you show it to them. So optimize to show it to them, optimize it to get it, you know, that's one of the that's one of these kind of ideas that's kind of fairly core to continuous delivery. Ideally, we want to get stuff out into the hands of your users in small steps as frequently as we can so that we can close that feedback loop so that we can learn from the users. So we can put, you know, do you like this or do you like this? And we can decide which one. We can do A-B testing if we've got a sufficiently large user base, or at least we can just monitor. If I make this change, we can make turn it into an experiment. If I make this change, I predict that we're going to recruit more, more, more customers. So monitor the number of customers. Design it as an experiment. Measure site reliability engineering. You know, pick your service level um, uh, indicators and define your service level objectives as part of the, the creation of the feature. And do that feature by feature. And that gives you a way, again, into in engineering terms, of getting a little bit more into the realm of measurement and experimentation rather than just guesswork and crossing your fingers and hoping. Dave, thank you very much. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure having you here with us today. And hopefully we will have you again in the future. So everybody is enjoying. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.